Uh, I, I send the slides to Slack channel so you can you can get you can read this. So mainly there will be like three parts. First, I uh, make make the definitions. Uh, second, we will uh, briefly touch up on Meyer. It's uh, it's relatively simple method, and we we go into details with this. I hope we'll try to understand it from the from the inside, so you will have a really good intuition how it actually works. And then we move to the Cox regression, which is uh, yeah, it's the, the most uh, used method probably now for survival analysis. So what I've seen. Yeah, again, disclaimer that I, I took uh, everything from uh, somewhere. Um, so uh, what's the difference now? We we have in the outcome we have a second dimension. We have time. So we have not only status, not only class, but uh, we we also have the time t. Uh, there is also a very important concept, this censoring of data, I will uh, talk about it uh, a bit uh, later. Yeah. And survival analysis is just an umbrella term for the time to event analysis. For example, the dentist who wants to know when the, um, when the uh, tooth work has to be redone, when some plan uh, go out. Uh, it's also survival analysis, just full survival analysis. There are many uh, methods. Uh, there is also machine learning approaches to survival, and we will kind of uh, touch random forest uh, in uh, survival, but we will mainly concentrate on the non-parametric and semi-parametric method, which is uh, non-parametric is Kaplan Meyer, and the semi-parametric is code regression in, it, in their simplest form. So there are uh, a lot of uh, things on top of, uh, of this, but we will uh, discuss only the, the basics because this topic is big. This topic is this analysis, like Kaplan uh, uh, Meyer is uh, relatively easy in my opinion, but Cox regression is something which is not so easy to understand. <coughs> yeah, so this is, uh, th th these are three plots, unfortunately they're not too big. This is that three plots from uh, our paper, uh, like Axel uh, here, uh, we are quarters on this paper. This Kaplan Meyer plot, this uh, is paper about the um, uh, really like special outcome of immunotherapy in melanoma and glass melanoma is the hyperprogression, uh, tumor hyperprogression, when the, uh, like, you all know about immunotherapy, they revolutionized the field of the uh, oncology, uh, but uh, unfortunately for some patients, when we uh, administer immunotherapy, the uh, tumor reacted, reacts aggressively. Tumor reacts like it starts to grow uh, super rapid. So the, the rate of growth was like, uh, it was probably, I don't know, stable or uh, slightly growing, and then immunotherapy is administered, and then the, the tumor uh, uh, grows. So, uh, these are the uh, kaplan meyer curves, survival curves from uh, different cohorts. Uh, it's like 60 patients who had tumors and they were stratified in different groups. On top, for example, is the type of melanoma, is acral, uh, anorectal, or mucosal melanoma. Second is the presence of metastasis in liver. Third is the response to uh, immunotherapy. Different colors are uh, different. Uh, sub cohorts and uh, here is the survival. It's from zero to one. One is like everyone is alive, zero is like everyone is dead. And you see the, the, the stepwise curve here. Step, 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 each step is dead. Each tick, you see there are some ticks here, is the sensor data. We'll discuss it a bit later. So uh, as I said, uh, this uh, survival analysis is umbrella term. In uh, computational oncology, for example, there is uh, the survival, how we understand it, is uh, only overall survival. It's OS, so if you ever will be communicating with the uh, oncologists, they will be using just these acronyms. They don't bother to explain anything. Uh, but uh, then, for example, progression free survival, it's not survival in a strict sense. It's not that the person is dying after, um, after the uh, tumor starts to uh, progress again. It's uh, just uh, time to event. We just call it survival because it's kind of convenient, because the survival analysis which is applied to this data. There are many, many different uh, endpoints in this uh, uh, oncology. It's uh, like metastasis free survival, this free survival. So yeah, this is the, the plot explaining uh, how this, if uh, any of you will ever join uh, the clinical uh, part. So this is another uh, example of uh, applying of survival analysis. This is a cardiovascular, this is a famous cardiovascular uh, scale here, which is uh, needed to determine the risk of any person to have a heart attack in the next 10 years. So this is the actual risk, like, uh, the uh, bright green is less than 1%, 
and the dark Darwin is more than 15 percent the chances that this person will have heart attack. Here, uh, what we have here, uh, of course, survival analysis of huge cohorts were applied to get these scores. Uh, why we still use these tables? Why the cardiologists still use these tables? Because they still don't kind of trust uh, machine learning methods. So they, uh, they still prefer to, to have something uh, they can understand. These points, the assigned points, it's, it's, it's a bit stupid in, the, like in my opinion, in the uh, era of uh, machine learning or computations. We need to know risk. We don't need to know the risk points. It's like uh, these risk points, they are kind of sensitive. So a person should come and uh, like provide the data, all available like clinical factors, and then um, the person wants to know the risk, not the points. Uh, which it has on this score. So the, you see women and men, and the predictors are the um, level of cholesterol, the age. Age is the, uh, the biggest uh, risk factor here. So you see at 65, it doesn't matter if you're non smoker and if you have uh, perfect blood, blood pressure, it's kind of still, you still have uh, increased risks of uh, cardiovascular incident. Here, so it's another example. Um, and the uh, Third example, it's uh, from uh, kind of from personal life. Is sometimes uh, you do survival analysis, you have a large cohort, you track it uh, carefully. Uh, we had a cohort of patients, which we were taking from 2012, maybe, yes. It's 5,000 patients. And then, like, we developed some models, we uh, were make uh, telephone surveys uh, every two years if the person died or from what the person died. And then all the models get broken because COVID comes and the cardiovascular incidents start to behave completely different. And this is uh, uh, this one you cannot really study with the simple survival analysis. Here is kind of competing events here. So that with, uh, when COVID came, all this study became much more complicated. Okay, so this is another example, but we will not learn how to deal with these situations because this is an advanced analysis. So uh, a very important concept is uh, like uh, when you do epidemiological study, you start your uh, uh, research and you end your research. And you cannot actually uh, track um, patients after you ended your research. So this is uh, censoring of data. So the period when you when you were looking at the patient, it's called uh, the time of research, for example. Uh, and uh, for example, if the uh, we started the research, the person is alive here, and uh, the event happened here, then it's uh, not uh, this data is considered uncensored. The event happened here. If the uh, event happened after the, we finished the study, it's called sensor data. We don't see this that event happened. We just we are limited here. The last time we, we we learned something about this patient was here. Uh, also, if the uh, person is still alive and without any uh, incident, is the right sensor. When we don't know when the, uh, the disease started or uh, when the patient comes in the middle of the uh, course. We call it right, the left sensor, and this type of sensing we will not uh, consider. The analysis of left, sen the left sensor data is uh, beyond the scope, and there is also interval sensing. We, we don't know the exact time of the event. Some event happened, but where uh, we don't know. It's, it, it happens more often than it seems so. Uh, when we do these telephone surveys of uh, people, like uh, if some cardiovascular event happened, uh, it's really often that relatives don't know when it happens. Like, yeah, it, it, like uh, our relative who lived with us, for example, died from uh, uh, myocardial infarction, but you don't know when. So it's like uh, just half a year ago or maybe a year ago. So the uh, this type of sensing, yeah, usually it's, it's possible kind of to deal with this. You kind of average in this interval, and you you, you try to say that the event happened somewhere in the middle. Uh, yeah. So. Um, we, uh, we have uh, two things, we have uh, survival time and we have uh, sensing time. And we see only one of these, we see only minimum. If, uh, uh, if someone, uh, it's either sensing, the person is alive or, or uh, the event happened after the sensing or we, we see the time till event. Here and we also see status. This delta is status, is zero, is nothing happened and the one is uh, event happened here, so we see pairs of uh, uh, pairs of values: this time and this status. Uh, our data set, so our response, in, uh, not anymore one y. It's uh, time and status here. Uh, very important: the sensing is, uh, is assumed to be independent on uh, internal independence. So uh, 
It really rarely uh, true in real applications. Uh, um, most of the time, censoring, for example, the patient stopped answering, decided to quit the uh, clinical study. Most of the time, it, there are some underlying reasons there. For example, uh, the, the patient uh, feels uh, well and he doesn't want to, he or she doesn't want to spend time anymore on this clinical study. It's very difficult to control, but it's it's assumption of the mathematical methods here that the censoring is not informative. Yeah, but the survival function is a very important uh, thing. So uh, all the time, all the analysis that we will be trying to do, we will try to estimate the survival function. Uh, it's the basically the, it's really similar to probability density. It's uh, a probability that the uh, um, object will survive past the time t. It's uh, always decreasing. So with uh, each second, uh, we consider that it's less probable, uh, less or the same probable than the uh, object is still alive. Uh, we will use this notion. Uh, you will need this uh, notation Q, uh, D, and R uh, for the practical part because you will have to kind of you have to you will have to manually build some plot here. So uh, please remember what it is. These are the time of events. D1, D2, D, uh, D, K. These are uh, time of uh, uh, Death. In our framework, we will go death, but you know it can be any event. Uh, QK is the number of patients who died at time K. Uh, uh, in our data set, we will be using uh, very fine grained data, so there will be no situation when the uh, two or more subjects will be considered dead at the same time. Yep. Why is it basically less time? What's up? Is it not now meaning less time? Uh, there are times. There are also ties, for example, if two, two patients die on the same day and uh, your grain is the uh, one day. Or sometimes it's very really often that the grain, uh, your uh, minimum uh, unit is one month. So like 10 12 patients die, and uh, yeah, it's only one uh, D2 is the, for example, month of May. Uh, yeah. And uh, in our example, uh, each patient will have their the own unique time, but uh, it's not true in general. Uh, and the uh, RK will be number of patients uh, who life just before the, uh, this uh, time of event. And what we need to do, we need to estimate uh, for each K, we need to be able to estimate this uh, probability function. It's like probability that this, uh, there is some inference here. I just show you the uh, kind of the result of the inference that uh, to estimate the survival time at time k, we need to do it recursively. So we need to uh, uh, have the probability, conditional probability that the patient survive uh, above time k uh, if the patient survived in the previous step, multiplied by the previous survival function. So it's uh, it's recursive. It repeats itself through the uh, different case here. And uh, yeah, so this is how it looks. It's, it's really recursive. You see there are multiplications of many many uh, multipliers, which are just like the uh, same function at different time point, time one, time two, time three. You just multiply them all, and this is uh, this is the formula you will actually need. That's why I say it's better to remember what is Rj, uh, uh, Qj, and Rj. So this slide, yeah, this slide, this, uh, uh, mm, this notation you will need. Further, this is the function we will try to estimate. Now we will try to do it, we will have data set, we will try to do it by hand, just to get the intuition how this censoring affects this uh, survival function. What, like, when it appears, why, why it matters that the, some patients are getting not dead, just like they got lost for the uh, further follow-up. Uh, the data set is from this paper, it's a relatively new paper, so it's not some synthetic, uh, not some very synthetic data set, it's real data. Here, uh, it's the uh, survival of patients with the brain uh, tumors. And uh, this is uh, uh, the first steps, is like explore the data set, what this data set, what are the predictors which are used there. So uh, please load this package uh, ISLR2. It's the introduction to statistical learning. It's the package which is supplied with the, with the book. And load this data of brain cancer. Check, uh, check the predictors, check the values, if everything is weird there. So let's spend like three, four, five minutes checking what it is. 
what are data set is, what are the dimensions of the data set. You can plot some like uh, summary. Summary usually provides actually summary <laughs> of the columns. So This document you haven't slept. Theoretically, now you can copy and paste this code, so it just it's not so much to copy and paste. Yep, so quite naturally what they measured in this uh, in this study it was the volume of the tumor, the size, like it's the size, it's the three-dimensional, um, the sex of the uh, patients, uh, the, uh, the diagnosis, LG or HG, I think it's low grade and high grade, uh, gliomas uh, location, it's a uh, it's very specific medical term, this infratentorial or super uh, supraterritorial is uh, the location inside the areas of the brain. Here, uh, the Karnovsky index, I, uh, yeah, it's, it's actually an interesting thing, but you, uh, you can find it on Wikipedia, only in German you can find it on Wikipedia, but still it's kind of, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's a natural concept, this Karnovsky index. Um, yep, and then the type of CRP. <laughs> yep, so uh, this is the response that we have. Uh, what I did here, I just ordered uh, by time, so now we have uh, the event that happened uh, first. Uh, it's on top, and events which are uh, happening later. What we will be doing now, we will plot this data set, and we will check our intuition. We will, uh, we will try to, uh, to pinpoint in R, in base R, by the way, we will try to pinpoint uh, points where the events uh, actually occurred. Uh, we need to uh, to match with the plot. If uh, if you try to apply the formula and your points don't don't uh, uh, fit the line which is produced in R, then uh, you understood the formula wrong. We need to apply this formula. Oh, sorry. This formula uh, using this definition Q R like number of patients alive just before the uh, uh, time uh, of that K. And the Q is the number of patients who died at time K. You need to apply this. You need to put this into this formula. It's just uh, uh, at each time step, it's multiplication of uh, many stepwise uh, multipliers. Um, and from this data set, you have to come to a plot. So this is uh, uh, how to calculate it by hand. Let's go like this. So to calculate the first uh, point, we, uh, we have uh, time is 0 0.07. This is kind of something we don't need to calculate. But then we need to uh, calculate the pr 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 proportion of uh, patients who survived here, taking into account this sensory. Here, so these are uh, the events. So what I suggest to you, I suggest to you, uh, this is just a reminder. So you, you, will, have, uh, you will see this uh, notation Q and R. Uh, this is a reminder of what they mean. And this is what I suggest you to do. You create the object uh, uh, called SUR, uh, KM, and just couple of mile, just uh, short of couple of mile. So create this object, plot it. Xlim, you can put from 0 to 30, for example. It's just like if you, if you plot it uh, all the data set, all the timeline, uh, it will be difficult to see the points that we will be like, throwing at this uh, plot. That's why I limited it to 20. You can plot the whole KM, you can pick up a large laptop, you can plot it all. And then you need to throw like maybe 10 points using this formula to be sure. I, I show how to put the first point here. Next point, I show the, the, this kind of the second point. Uh, please uh, put like 10 points on this plot. 
to be sure that you understand how the censoring affects the uh, calculations here. Like the, the patient lost for follow-up, and uh, how we see it in the formula. Uh, yes. The surf function from which language? Surf. Uh, ah, survival. Sorry, I forgot to talk about survival. Yes. survival. You love the survival, yeah? Uh, uh, library survival. She took the base now. Yeah, so this, this object, uh, you must specify time and event from your data set. So uh, it just this exercise is very important to understand how sensing actually works. Like these patients who are uh, who, who pass through whole clinical study without events, how they affect the, the result? Do we do we need them? Can we just throw them out? No, we cannot. And here you will see how numbers will be affected by this sensing. So this is how, uh, how it should look, more or less, in the end. And this is the dots I expect to see here. If you don't try it uh, by hand, if you just use the plot, uh, the intuition of censoring is kind of, it doesn't count. So each time with each new death, we just multiply the proportion of people who survive by the, by the, by the new proportion. Each time we update this number, and the, it will be the proportion on the plot here. Here is the formula. We need to, to write this formula. You need to understand why this thing updated like this. Why the survival function is updated taking into account the sense of patients. Of course, zeros are the uh, patients without the event, the sensor, and one is with the event. Does it work? Are, are the dots falling in the exact uh, uh, curve? Okay, so you understood the principle, how it works. So we skip, when we, uh, when we perform this survival function estimation, we skip the sensor to them. At previous, uh, previous step, this sensor uh, patients, they were adding more power to our, uh, our inference of this survival function, but then they're lost, and they kind of, confidence intervals are going wider and wider, you see here, because uh, it's less and less patients there, and we, we are less and less sure in what's going on there. Did it work for everyone? Yeah. So, we returned to the previous slide. Uh, return to previous slide, this one? Yeah. I also sent these slides to slide, so you, uh, you don't need to retype this time. It's not downloaded. Ah, it's not downloaded. Ah, it's not downloaded. Yeah, uh, it's, it's not about retyping, it's about understanding how we update these things. So why here it was like in previous step it was 85 out of 86, risk it was hazard uh, uh, to the uh, to, uh, hazard to patient at this uh, time. And why it's immediately 82 out of 83? Why there is like only one patient died here, but then the estimation goes, uh, several patients got missing here in this calculation. It's because they got censored. 
So nothing, nothing magical here. We just understand that we just, at, at this step, we don't care when the patient was censored, we go through the death times, and when the patient was censored, we, we, we stop including this patient for the next calculations. Yeah, so that's why our certainty in the end are less and less, because we're losing that uh, sample size with each step. Either they're dead or the um, tensor. <coughs> yeah. So with something like this, if you if you're able to go a bit further, if you're able to do a bit further, then you you're good. You actually understood really well how it's going on. You see, like each dot, what I mean, is it should fall into the exact step of these stairs. The height of uh, it's like approximately equal, yeah, indeed, because there are some patients who are getting censored in the middle, but it's because we have unique uh, death times for the uh, patients. I still don't know how I get the numbers like 85 uh, divided by 86. Uh, it's, uh, it's from here. So you see, the, uh, this is the number of patients who died, it's usually one for us. And this number of patients alive just before the event. Mm -hmm. If the patients got censored here, for okay. example, patients got censored, and the, this, uh, when we include in this uh, calculation, we don't include them anymore because they got censored already before this event happened. That's why we, th we throw them away. The data. So we look, the death time one is here, 0 0.07. Death time 2 is 1, for, uh, 41. These are lost in the middle. Death time 3 is 3, uh, 38. Uh, death time 4, death time 5. Then again, two patients got censored in the middle. We don't include them into calculations at the next step. That's why uh, the numbers are decreasing in this way. Because they, they lost for follow-up, these patients. That's why I asked to, to, to do it by hand, just because the intuition is not that straightforward. But we just applied this uh, formula that I said, we just applied this formula by definition of this QK, D, uh, D1, DI, and uh, RK. We just applied this formula. Please continue. Please add one or two more points to be sure that you understood how, uh, how it's calculated. It sounds a bit uh, strange that we just kind of retyping the same thing once again, but it's, it's needed for the intuition. Please add three more points to this plot. So like here, be sure that it fits here, here, and here. That you understood.
Uh, that's the topic I will talk to you later. It's, uh, as you can see, at each step is the proportion. Yeah. So you can basically calculate proportion of each step. And that is the draw for the proportion. Did it work? Yep. yep. That means that probably. Uh, yes, yes. This is definitely the result of my code. But, uh, these points are definitely the result of the code that I did, so probably. There's some additional new line or something like this. This is uh, this is what I use to generate this plot. So it would, it would be strange if it's uh, we plotting something different. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah, here is a new line, maybe this creates a problem. No? Ah, I see, I guess I'm sorry. It seems like even it's another, like, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, even it's a part of the server function, and it seems like it's another server. I mean, yeah. Even, yeah, it's a part of the server, but I'm not sure it's okay if you're, I'm just like. Ah, okay, okay, nice, nice, nice. I, I, I did forgot to include library survival in the end. Probably when I was copy pasting code, I forgot it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, no, I think this one was first here, this, so I always connect it. Sure. Yeah. Should have been connected here. Yes. I forgot to put this slide library survival. <laughs> Sorry for this, it has to be uh, included before this. So, before the library starts. So this is what I think Emma uh, uh, and more or less understood how the censored uh, censored data affecting our calculations. Am I right? Okay, you all have some intuition now. You were able to put a couple of more dots here, right? Okay, good. Um, this is uh, the couple of my curve, like it's the basic survival. Uh, uh, with one group, so we didn't divide them into any groups here. But the uh, typical application of a couple of is comparison between two subgroups here. So this is the uh, code uh, which you can use to uh, compare survival between males and females there. I use this DG subplot because it uh, makes a nice picture, but I never had troubles with installing this package. Uh, I think it connects a lot of dependencies. So uh, this is uh, sort of minor, I think it's sort of minor, and uh, I hope it works for you, installation of this uh, sort of minor. So uh, this is the, the code which uh, makes this uh, nice plot, which is uh, the red is the uh, female and the uh, green, or blue, I don't know how to call this uh, color, it's uh, male. And uh, here the uh, type of confidence intervals, there are, there are different methods to calculate confidence intervals for the curves. And uh, this is just one of the widely used here. So there is some mathematics. And it's, uh, I said that it's a proportion test, so we calculate everything as a proportion test. It's not exactly true. Uh, uh, so it's there is some magic, uh, uh, some magic there. Uh, uh, this is the common uh, conf int equal to true, which means we want to plot the confidence intervals here. And what you also can notice is the p, it's p-value here. It's a p-value of differences between the males and females. How to add this p-value? You just, to the last column, the, the GSR plot, you add the comma, p-value equal to true. And it will calculate a log run test for you. So, uh, let's try to uh, make this plot with p-value also. Add here, comma, p-value, through. This is the code. This is why I put this this table. This is the uh, like the, the number of patients who died, number who survived. Group one, group two. Does it remind you of something? This uh, this table. I'm just I'm, I'm, I'm trying to show intuition from where appears the significance, from where we take the value. Does it remind you of something? Do you remember any statistical test which deals with this type of data? It's exact feature test. Yes, so basically the whole magic uh, goes into the hyper distribution again. We compare observed and expected. 
uh, calculation of the observed and expected is a bit more complicated here because we update it each time. So this is the uh, like the, the new procedure. So here uh, we go through the time. So J, it's a time. Uh, uh, this is the label of class. So we, uh, it's not straightforward. We, we, we don't just go to the last time point and compare the proportion to the last time point. No, we have uh, sensor data. That's why the computation is done of this log run test again stepwise. So we go through all the points. Uh, our new hypothesis is that there is no difference between groups, so we calculate everything based on the uh, mixed group and compare it with the results from different groups. So uh, standard statistic is standard normal uh, standard normal distribution. So we, again, we uh, as in proportion test, we take the observed value. For example, we uh, observed 30 patients died in the group of uh, high grade glioma, and we look at expected values. Like, 20, we expect only 20 patients died from the glioma group uh, if, if there is no difference between different groups. And then we divide by uh, variance and we get standard normal distribution from 0 to 1. From standard normal distribution, this is bell shape, we can get p value here. So it's a couple of mile in this sense, it's very, very easy here. Um, there is a really nice uh, paper written by a statistician uh, where the uh, person, like in the uh, field of Epidemiology, I would say, uh, the way they teach uh, this survival analysis, they always go through some example step by step, like we did uh, just with the uh, death events. Uh, only, only that's how you get the intuition. So uh, this uh, in, in this paper, uh, this statistician there, by statistician, he goes through the log run test step by step. We will not go uh, now, but for the ones who want to understand how this p-value appears there, it's a really good uh, material here. Uh, so this is a practical task now. Can you make the uh, uh, Kaplan-Meier uh, significant? Can you get significant p-value from here? You need to change sex to something else from the data set and check if... Uh, don't, uh, don't put continuous variable because Kaplan-Meier works only with category. You can, put, you can try to put continuous variable inside, but we will see what happens. Most probably it will crash. So find some predictor which gives you the significant uh, uh, difference between the groups. You need to change uh, here sex to something else from the data set of brain cancer. We are doing kind of big hacking now. Yeah. <laughs> Don't forget to apply multiple test correction when you do when you explore explore your data set in this way. Uh, uh, multiple test correction. <laughs> you did uh, you, yeah, you did five tests, you, you apply for five tests. You, you, you can apply this family wiser rate, so you just divide 0 0.05 by five tests. If you perform five tests, you have to apply 0 0.01 uh, value. And the important is 0 0.05. That's kind of... <laughs> but you can also use this FDR adjusted method. Even though the adjusted method, if you apply only several tests, if you perform only five tests or ten tests, I, uh, this bond, uh, the Jamini Hohenberg procedure is uh, it's not super stable there. So in this small number of tests, applying these default uh, methods, it's very good for differential expression with 20,000. And the, this, uh, uh, how to say, the Benjamin Hohenberg can look at the, all the uh, values there, but uh, it's not good when you perform only five tests. It, it doesn't have enough material to infer which is false positive, which is uh, not false positive here. So, in this particular data set, when we have five predictors, this uh, multiple test correction will be a bit tricky. Okay, uh, did, uh, did it work? Did you find any predictor which is uh, significant? Yeah. Which one? Diagnosis. Yeah, diagnosis. If we, if we check diagnosis, uh, Patients with the uh, diagnosis, so interpretation is relatively uh, easy, I think. This high grade glioma, I think uh, we looked at observed how, how many patients died, and this is how, how, how many patients we expected to be dead by the end of the, if there, there were no difference between groups. And we see that the, uh, much more patients died than we expected. And this is the value of statistics observed uh, minus expected divided by a variance here. And it's, it's kind of huge, and the p value of this uh, Kaplan-Meier is super, super small. Okay, so, yes, indeed, uh, we can uh, conclude that um, diagnosis really affects the survival of the patient. Uh, here, it's kind of it's a, it's a well known fact, so 
In this uh, particular context, we can also refer to the previous uh, data. Uh, and the, uh, so we finish with Kaplan Meyer because Kaplan Meyer is kind of it's nice, but it's really, uh, it does really a lot to switch on many confounders, many predictors. It, it mainly allows you to uh, uh, separate into several categorical groups and perform this non parametric analysis. It doesn't carry the assumptions. Uh, um, yeah, so it's, it's pretty limited. Kaplan Meyer, doctors like Kaplan Meyer because that's kind of uh, understandable. But if you do any serious survival analysis, you have to do something like Cox regression or other models. We just consider only two models now, it's Kaplan Meyer and Cox regression. Here, so uh, yeah, we, we, we fit regression like we fit uh, linear regression, we will try to predict the survival time. Here, the important concept is the hazard. Uh, in the, uh, like in the uh, wrong, but kind of understandable way to give the intuition, hazard is the probability to die within the next seconds. It's not exactly uh, what it is, uh, but uh, let's think about it uh, like this. Uh, hazard ratio, people uh, speak about hazard ratio a lot in the medical literature, what it is. It's the uh, uh, ratio between hazard if the, the same, exactly the same uh, patient had uh, been exposed to the factor. Like for example, if, if the patient was smoker, divided by the hazard that the patient was not exposed to this factor. So this hazard ratio, hazard ratio uh, equal to, means that uh, the probability of dying within the next seconds for the uh, exposed uh, person is uh, higher. Here, uh, here I really, uh, now I really don't understand why I added here. It's a bit of mathematics. There are points how you can infer this uh, form of uh, regression. This is hazard function. So it's, uh, this one is an important concept. It's how hazards uh, changes with the t, with the time. Here, uh, that's what I say, uh, that it's a bit of lying, that it's probability of dying within the next seconds, because it's also divided by the delta t here, which is uh, limited to zero, uh, not limited, it, uh, it approaches zero here. Uh, so the, these are points how you infer, uh, uh, how you infer the hazard function, and the, uh, this is the, the, the form of regression. You, you remember there were beta coefficients in the linear regression. Here the same betas appear, and the, this is predictor. Um, uh, predictors uh, uh, x, uh, i, g. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it reminds you, but we, uh, we can predict hazard function in this case. Uh, so why Cox model is called model of proportional hazard? The hazard here has two components. One is the regression component, which is parametric component, which is like we have some assumptions about distributions here. And this is non-parametric component. We don't care what is h0 of p. The hazard ratio changing with the time can be any. It can be, uh, for example, uh, after the surgery, for example, predicted around the surgery, it can be hazard, baseline hazard, can be super high in the beginning and go really low in one year after the surgery. Or vice versa, it's, uh, it may be increasing till the end. So this kind of function, we don't have any assumptions on this. It's, uh, uh, that's why it's called also semi-parametric. So the, uh, the ratio between uh, the, uh, the relative risk uh, of the patient it, uh, uh, remains constant, which means that the patient with uh, some uh, predictors uh, if, we, if we calculate hazard ratio uh, through the time course, it will be the same according all the time. Yeah. Yeah, this I already explained, it's why it's called semi-parametric, because one component is parametric, one is regression component, and one component can take any uh, values there. Uh, what in practice means the proportional hazard? These are uh, two columns. This column are the hazards, depending on the time. You see the time from zero to two, hazards is increasing. The green and the uh, black, in this case, is the uh, Cox regression with only one covariance, so it's one, only one predictor. It's easier to show only one predictor. This is the, the uh, predictor is equal to zero. This predictor is equal to one. It's like smoker or non-smoker or some other predictor. You see, uh, along the time course, the uh, ratio between them remains the same uh, in a logarithmic scale, the distance between them, which means in the non-logarithmic scale, it means the ratio. And this is a survival function, so you see the uh, kind of the survival time for the, the hazard for the uh, black uh, 
line is higher and the, the patient's kind of dying here. If you see, if you make diagnostic plots and your hazards are crossing, you cannot apply a COX injection anymore. The assumptions are violated here. Um, uh, the way we infer this regression form, it's really similar to Kaplan Meier thing. Uh, this phase zero T, uh, it's uh, non parametric it can take any form. So, in theory, we cannot just switch it into the some likelihood method because we cannot measure it. It's something unknown to us. But if it applies same stepwise logic as in Kaplan Meier, we can cancel this term, which is non parametric out. Here, um, yeah, uh, it, it's also important there is no intercept in this uh, COX regression because we have baseline hazard and it kind of replaces the uh, baseline here. Uh, there are several assumptions uh, which are useful to check before you apply this COX regression. It's the uh, independence of survival times. Um, this is the really difficult to uh, control. Uh, second is the uh, multiple equal relationship between the predictors mm -hmm. and the hazard. And the third is constant hazard ratio, as we discussed before, over time. How to measure the performance of the Cox regression? We talked about model evaluation, and I skipped on purpose uh, the evaluation of the uh, survival models. Um, it's uh, Harald Concordance uh, Index. This Frank Harald developed this. It's my kind of uh, my statistical guru. Uh, I really recommend to follow his Twitter and to, to, to read the blog post that he's making. He, he also had a really amazing course in regression modeling. Uh, oh, I also really recommend, but it's for money, so it's not advertisement. I'm not, I'm not paid by Frank Carl. Uh, he developed this index. Uh, why, why we cannot just apply AUK as we did before this uh, receiver operating curve? Because we have censoring. And in censoring, it's absolutely unclear what to do. So uh, what the C index, it takes into account censoring. We will see how uh, how it deals with this. What means the uh, C index of 0 0.7, that's uh, like giving to random uh, patients from the um, test set. We should see 70% uh, uh, accuracy who will die first, uh, according to, uh, like, depending on the predictions on the model. This is the plot, which is explains this C index. It's also important to understand uh, our model predicts for red patient higher risk. We don't care how, how much higher it is. We just it's, it's just somewhat higher risk by ten by one hundred percent. I don't know. Uh, and the green one has a lower risk. So uh, uh, here we uh, calculate uh, this uh, concordant pairs and discordant pairs. That's how the uh, C index calculated. We take all the concordant pairs uh, divided by Concordant plus discordant pairs, and this is the situations where the concordants uh, are measured. So, uh, if the time of event of the red of the higher risk uh, patient happened earlier than in the green uh, patient, then it's concordant. If it uh, vice versa it happened later, it's discordant. Now, uh, and the trick with the censoring data, uh, we, we we discard two of the situations. So, if both of them are censored, we discard them. Uh, if uh, if we observe only uh, one time, uh, if only high risk patient died, and the uh, green one we don't see, if we discard this pair again, and uh, if the uh, green patient low risk survived over the uh, end of the study, then we still call it concordant pair, and we switch it in into this beautiful formula, and we get the C index. That's how it's calculated here. So that's. That's more or less standard thing. Uh, it has more or less the same properties as the uh, this uh, area under the curve. 0 0.5 is like random. Your model is easily bad. Zero is like anti-concordance. You forgot your switch. So you have to switch your uh, labels, class labels, and the one is the perfect, perfect prediction here. So this is how you fit uh, Cox regression. Here I didn't forget the survival, so uh, just. Uh, let's fit it against the, uh, one uh, variable, which is again sex in the uh, brain cancer. And uh, check the summary of it. Check uh, what model says. Is it significant or not? I don't remember, but it shouldn't be significant. Yeah, it's not significant. Again, this object surf, it appears. It create, it's created here. It's kind of the core of these methods. You have to create this soup object first.
for the ones who already fit this test for the proportional hazards, there is this test. Is it significant or not? If it's significant, then it's likely violated, violated the assumption of proportional hazards. So is the regression significant for only sex as a predictor? No, it's not significant. Uh, as we see in Kaplan Meyer, it's not. So same conclusion. Here, of course, you don't need to, to, to put all these predictors. You can put dot. You can put just dot here and then replace all these predictors. Is the model with all predictors significant? Yeah. That's what it is. So yeah, it's kind of it shows that in couple we would be able to, to include all of them and uh, like wait. We would be able to work with only one variable. And not with continuous. And here is the volume, the last summer volume is continuous. Did it work for everyone? So you see how the output looks like. It looks very nice, so very similar to the uh, what we have in the linear regression here. This is like a log of uh, this exponent here. So it's basically the same information in two columns. Uh, uh, this x is just for the interpretation. It will talk how to interpret the coefficients in the, in the well. You can, we can see two significant predictors, which is like a hybrid glioma. Uh, it has coefficient 8.6. Do you have any idea how, like, uh, out of your intuition, how would you expect uh, the 8.6 for the hybrid glioma? It, it means that uh, it increases. This uh, predictor increases the uh, risks for the patient. Mm -hmm. uh, yep. And the uh, another significant is the uh, this Karnowski index. As I told you, you cannot find it. On Wikipedia, it's only in German Wikipedia, but uh, it's still kind of worth to understand the idea. I, I would really recommend you to, to go to Wikipedia or like, to read it in brief what is Karnowski index. Yeah, it's the, the way of assessment, the way of assessment of the patient. So it's from 100% to 0%, and the way the doctors kind of uh, evaluate the overall state of. I would say severe. It's uh, mostly it's good for severe condition. Yeah. So uh, next slide uh, contains the uh, the exact interpretation of how we should interpret this. And like uh, it's the coefficient is one point two for male for sex male, which means that uh, male sex equal twenty percent increase in hazard, but it's totally non significant. It's zero point six. So the, the next task is a, a, a test full model, like this a fit all for the proportional hazard. If it's violated, then our results are not good at all. This is the comment for testing for proportional hazard. This is te uh, cox.zph. Test this fit all, put fit all instead of fit cox. Here and test if the model is uh, assumption of proportional hazard is actually true. Not true, but like not rejected. Not rejected. No. And explain. Uh, it's uh, this. This is not a difficult task now. Just to get, like, uh, can you explain why the high grade glioma and the Karnowski index? Why they are the they are in this way? They are affecting it this way. Why Karnowski index is actually kind of is reducing? Why increasing it in Karnowski index is reducing the chances of patient to die? It's not a statistical task. Now it's uh, kind of, you'll find on Wikipedia what the Karnowski index is and why it's, uh, when it grows, the patient less chances to die. Why we do this? It's very important if you find some significant results to check if they make sense. 
if the uh, previous literature uh, would contain information that high-grade glioma is actually better for survival than the uh, other types of tumors. And we have this result, then most probably our results are wrong. Each of these, uh, of something that you find, you have to interpret in the context of existing knowledge. If your uh, results contradict the existing knowledge in a like, really well-established knowledge, then either you made uh, something wrong or you won Nobel Prize. You can apply for Nobel Prize. Uh, you made a great uh, success, but normally you're wrong. Normally it's some, some problem with announcing. So uh, who can explain why Kravnowski index is uh, affecting in a positive way? Why increasing Kravnowski index leads to, leads to better uh, prognosis? Yes, it's uh, like uh, the, the zero is like it's uh, it's that patient, and the hundred percent is the uh, it's better shape. So it increase the kind of index is actually an uh, increase of the shape of the patient. And it's also Polish, yeah, German, Polish, but not English. Yeah, <laughs> it's like only yeah, only special. Yeah. Uh, yep. So uh, this is the next success, probably the last exercise for today. What we do, we simulate patients here. Now we simulate patients and we predict the survival for these patients. This is just an example. This is, uh, I, I created four females for uh, this uh, supratentorial uh, and the, instead of the Karnovsky index, I put the average Karnovsky indexes for everyone. This is the, so create one, uh, one patient or two or three uh, with you know, like you, uh, something that, uh, imagine it's a real patient that comes to you and fill the, uh, the data how you kind of, uh, how you think, imagine the patient, and uh, check the survival function, which will be plotted by this comment. This legend thing, you don't, uh, you don't, this legend thing, but just plot. You can copy and paste this, of course, yeah. but simply change this new data set. Out of kind of fun, you can put some other realistic values there. For example, Karnovsky index to uh, 120, which we understand it does exist, but model doesn't understand it. Model doesn't care if this uh, value is actually limited. So you can check how. I don't know if it will be broken or not. The model. Make it 1000, make Karnovsky index 1000, maybe it will go above 1. Maybe this will be resurrected. So instead of this rep, put uh, some of the other data. One patient is also enough, actually, I think. If instead of rep, you put just like female, then. What happens when Karnovsky index is huge? Someone tried to put it 1,000, for example. It goes to one. It goes to one. There's no one dies. The depression is so amazing. This model doesn't care about this, you see? Yeah. So that's why it's important to track for outliers in your data. That's why the exploration is very important. Because, for example, someone can uh, express this Karnovsky index as like from zero to one, and someone can make express it in percentage from uh, zero to 100%. It's, uh, it happens pretty often. Yep, in uh, uh, like my informaticians write uh, like 0 0.73 and clinicians write 73 percent. And if you mix this data together, you might get something like this: patients don't die. Uh, it's not that I'm locating the patients die; it's just like uh, it's unrealistic.
So these are plots for the patients with absolutely same everything except the uh, type of tumor. So it's kind of maybe in this case it's easier to make up on my curve if you care to know about this. So here maybe it's uh, kind of it's a valid way to estimate the half uh, half time survival. It's uh, widely used in the clinic, so kind of we we can uh, make some prognosis in this case, but we have to be especially careful. So and like uh, doctors, they, they deal with this absolutely differently. It's just like speculation. Predicting time to death is you know the or till the event is something from the ethical point of view. The way you communicate this, the way your model is uncertain, it's something very problematic. So yeah, this uh, we, we just try to simulate uh, other other methods for the survival. For example, there are trees, and as you know, it are kind of maybe okay if you want to show the clinician, but it's not okay if you want to do anything uh, yeah, anything useful here. Uh, so, uh, there is a, a way to plot, uh, to check how coverage varies uh, over time. Uh, Cox regression actually allows updating of uh, covariates. So during the uh, time course, you can uh, some uh, values like blood pressure may change. And Cox regression may, uh, may be taken into account. Uh, we, we don't touch it here, but uh, in general it's possible. And this is just the, the plot, it's the, uh, it's the class of models which are useful to do. And you perform analysis just to check how your uh, uh, your predictors, your uh, predictors uh, impact of them, how it's very over time. Uh, this is the diagnostics plots. Uh, as you know, when you do linear regression, we, we always, always do the diagnostic plot. These four plots that produce by linear regression always do this. Uh, I mean, for the regression with continuous outcome, the one with the uh, Logistic regression uh, is more difficult to assess, but in this case, we uh, what we do um, this uh, we check if the assumption of the uh, if there is a uh, departure from this. So if this line goes like sinusoidal or something, if it doesn't go as a straight line approximately, then the assumptions of our uh, model are violated, the hazards are not proportional, yep. and sometimes you can uh, uh, you can resolve it by adding covariate and time interaction here, or when, when you analyze uh, patients by groups. You know, then Cox regression is kind of, is better. If you can divide it into meaningful groups, you can deal with this. In this case, we uh, fit our model, and the, we check, we perform this test, and uh, nothing is violated here. Uh, this is even more uh, complicated diagnostic with different types of uh, residuals here. Uh, why I show this, not uh, to, to show all the uh, methods to diagnostic, but to show that it's actually a complex thing. Uh, people who do survival analysis, they are typically like the epidemiologists who get, got their degrees, who understand what's going on. So uh, even though I show the uh, survival analysis, I just want, to, want you to, to be careful about the applications of this. Uh, yep, so this is what happens, uh, how are the predictions, how coefficients are affected when you throw out uh, one or another uh, variable. Here, it's kind of importance of the uh, observations. Here, and we, uh, we can see that sometimes uh, some values really significantly affect coefficients when we throw them out. It's not uh, something that is expected. It's because the data set is not really big. That's why the, uh, any patient with glioma, when we throw it away, uh, we, we can uh, uh, imagine that the results are affecting greatly. So it does not necessarily mean that the model is bad. It's just for the small data set, you will always see that the influence of any observation, any extreme observation, glioma, high grade glioma is the extreme observation. It's a really strong uh, uh, factor of our uh, of, uh, survival of patients. Yeah, so that's something is fine. Uh, yeah, this is uh, another diagnostic plot, which is deviance from. Uh, uh, it's a, it's 
is a way to find the patients who died too soon or who, uh, who were supposed to die, but they didn't die. So there, uh, there sometimes uh, can affect your regression fit really strongly. So it's, it's worth to check if everything is recorded fine for these uh, outliers. Here it, uh, it's distributed for the like standard normal distribution, should be around uh, minus zero, and the deviance is like up to three. If everything goes above three or below minus three, then it's reason to work. Otherwise, in this particular case, for our model, it's kind of from minus two to three, it's fine. Our model is okay. Uh, this is the, uh, of course, you, uh, whatever you can do with the regression, you can also do with random forest, which is more like a machine learning approach. Uh, yeah, so here uh, I kind of show the, the basic run on our data of the random forest. Uh, yeah, you can copy and paste this just to fit this model. There is nothing to understand because it's random forest. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, it, it does its magic. It does burr, 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 and uh, it gives some results. It's not that I have to explain anything. Okay. Uh, what are the arguments that you're using? Uh, which one? Sorry? The, uh, at the end, uh, about the uh, extra. Which one? Uh, uh, about what? What's, what's the argument split rule? Ah, split rule. Uh, oof, that's a good question. I copied this from Stack Exchange. Yes. I explained it yesterday. You explained it yesterday. Yeah. Thank you, you saved me. You, yeah, it was explained yesterday. <laughs> you know. <laughs> what is it, Yes, I remember how you Ah, okay. Uh, and here is the extra page. I also don't remember what the extra page does. Oh, I can tell you. It means that uh, it's meaningless or what can happen. Ah, which means that everything is meaningless. Yeah, I can. Kind of, I agree. It means that it does not optimize what, what parameter to use. Ah, okay. Does that, ah, okay. So you, you choose random, right? Uh, random, okay. So yeah, maybe it's it's meaningless. Remove this expertise. Do do something meaningful. No, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 Through all the predictors. Predictors. Ah, okay. So, so it's sometimes it's more meaningful and the models are more robust, but they need more tweaks to be. Ah, okay, okay. So yeah, the, uh, okay. In this case, it's just like it allows the random forest to to go through predictors which are not on the top of this criteria. Here and it makes it more robust, but it requires more trees. Yeah. So you can specify them trees uh, 5,000, for example. I'm not sure if it will be much better. So yeah, yeah then you average the death times among these uh, among these different predictions. Here and what we can do, we can plot it. Of course, we can plot it. This is basically curves for all the patients from the data set. I think. No, it's not from all. It's uh, from 20. I think it's from top uh, from just 20 of them. That's how random forest predicts it. Is it accurate or not? Uh, you have to apply this uh, parallel index uh, to see. We don't we don't do this here. Uh, uh, finally, the final conclusion: the couple of mire is easy to interpret, and it's uh, it's one of the favorite models uh, in the clinics. Even though I think it's conceptually wrong, and like in the modern culture, for example, there's so many predictors. And you just, uh, if you look at just 35 by one particular uh, category, it, it's, it's conceptually wrong, in my opinion. But uh, people do this. Uh, we can estimate survival function in a non parametric way uh, with the Kaplan Meyer. Uh, it doesn't have any functional form, it's just the more or less uh, stepwise non parametric curve, which is useful for uh, kind of for analysis, but uh, not for extrapolation, for example. You can ext extrapolate the Curve which they estimated just like this. Uh, yeah, and only you can you can uh, analyze only few categorical features. Yeah, as a predictor, I mean, you can uh, This is model which I didn't cover. This is the the exponential model. 
Uh, yeah, it's it's kind of a functional. It's uh, it's a, it's really nice uh, model if you do some modeling. Uh, I mean, uh, some extrapolation. They're nicely looking. They're fitting the data well, but uh, they, they they have some unrealistic assumptions, like constant scalar ratio. And they're good if you if you're a mathematician and you, you do mathematical analysis of uh, the data. If you are kind of uh, start from machine learning perspective, then uh, it's better to use uh, Cox model. Is not machine learning. Yeah, it's uh, it's uh, it's. It's kind of mathematical thing still, so, uh, but still it has this non-parametric component inside. Yeah, uh, and the uh, pros is the that it can take this time hazard in a non-parametric way, whatever shape in your data says. Uh, it can, but it can, it has assumptions. Yeah, and it can. Um, yeah. This is the model of choice. I would say uh, it's a God's model. And that's more or less the survival analysis. Yep, I hope it was good. Questions? Someone has questions? Yep. I have questions. Uh, so, my first is uh, how do you do the both survival and the assumptions of the performance of the model? For example, one of the survival and the model, do you like ignore it? The test. Or do you like performance analysis or do you use different? Uh, I just apply this test. This, this test, statistical test for proportional hazard, like how, uh, how to check it. You can plot it I also. I don't know how to check it, but how do you approach it when it's significant for one of the predictors in the model? So you have, for example, five predictors, and for one, you have significant one, so the assumptions don't match for one of the predictors. How? Do you delete it from the model, or still you put it and discuss it with the relations? Okay. Yeah, it, it, it depends, of course. Uh, you, you can maybe check. Uh, you can you can maybe try to do feature engineering. It's, it's, it's the same as you, as you do with the um, in any other uh, like in, in, in simple linear regression. You also can face a situation. So yeah, it's, it depends on the situation. Uh, if you can do nothing, then it's better to throw it out. I would say if the assumption is violated, then you cannot trust the results. Is this if you try different methods, like uh, putting the square of this uh, predictor, uh, normalization of the predictor to now the outlier, and nothing worked, then uh, maybe it's better to throw it out. Okay. Yeah. So, so my second question is, am I actually correct that the survival trees don't make any, so those are non-parametric models, so they don't make assumptions like proportional hazards or about optimal distribution? Yeah, they don't. Okay. I think they don't. Yeah. So maybe there are like more options than we look at personal hazard. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And my final question, sorry, personally, uh, but I, I wonder if you can do approach uh, ordinal variables in your model. Because in the fields, there are many ordinal yeah. variables, like for example, tumor stage. Yes, so yes, yes. Distributed hematomas. How, yeah. so how do you do it? Which? Yeah, from the beginning, like it, it may be sound really bad, but from the beginning, I, I deal with them as the continuum. And the only if this does work, because uh, in these big data sets you have hundreds of predictors, and you have to go through all of them, understand which of them are ordinal, and uh, to understand which how to deal with them. Yeah, and in the beginning I put everything as a continuous. If it doesn't work, then I I think yeah. it's just like hey, okay, uh, I have to do. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, there are methods for dealing with ordinal. Uh, Ordinal predictors, ordinal outcomes. Yeah, they're kind of, I, I guess, a little advanced. So it's like beyond the scope. More questions? No, we can, we can go five minutes before the lunch. Okay. <laughs>